That's always what we want to watch out for. Something tiny. 
this whole thing. You see this big giant lure I have in my hand? This whole rig runs about 50 cents. When I pick up something else, this whole rig's about 150 bucks. 50 cents? 150 bucks. I could go out the exact same time of year and fish this $150 lure, and I could fish this 50 cent lure, and beat this lure to the ground. Why in the world would I be throwing this big thing and this little thing? I can buy a shoot a ton of these things instead of this, but why am I still throwing this? And I'll tell you why. What happens is, in the winter time, the water gets really, really clear. In the fall, the water gets really clear. In the spring, the water gets really clear. So this is a glide bait. You guys know what a glide bait is? How many people have heard of a glide bait? Do you know what a glide bait does? A glide bait goes just back and forth. Nothing special. Looks like a big old tasty looking trout. I don't know, you can call that a trout if you want to. It looks tasty, I might try it. But what this thing does is it's large and it goes side to side. A lure that goes side to side has drawing power. See this? Drawing power. Now what happens is, oh, do I see something? What happens is, when that water's clear, and you may not know where the bass are, I can throw something like a fly bait that's going side to side, and whether the fish are hungry or not, they will often follow this thing. Like I was saying the other day, you could be, there could be three giant female bass over here. They're sitting outside of Starbucks, right? This is the this corner, right? Oh, look at this dude. This is the Starbucks right here, all right? And I throw this glide bait by, and the glide bait just going by. She'll be having a conversation with a friend, and she'll start following it. She doesn't even know. She's like, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I got a mocha latte. And, they, and they'll talk about that mocha latte all the way to the boat, whether they're going to eat it or not. And then guess what happens? If I didn't notice where they came from, I know now I watch them turn around and go home. Now, oh, that's a big old rock right there. Instead of me guessing where fish are, I have an awesome search bait. This bait can find them for me in crystal clean water. I know the biggest fish in the lake will follow this thing out. Now, do you see why I can throw a $150 lure? Do you need to spend $150 on a lure? No. Are there other glide baits that'll do the same thing that are 25 bucks? Yes, there's a whole bunch of them at this show. There's some right over there at the Calcos booth. Now, when they follow these things out, that is a clue. This is a searching tool. How many of you heard the term pre-fishing? Pre-fishing? Well, generally, if you're not a tournament guy, you don't need pre-fish. From the guy, from the gal, you don't need to pre-fish. Well, in tournament fishing, we pre-fish because we're going to look for the big fish. Does it help if we catch the fish? Eh, maybe, if we couldn't see it. But what's gonna happen in pre-fishing is we're trying to find the biggest fish out there. That's what we are looking for. We are looking for the giant. So anything that's gonna help us find that giant is what we want to use. So now I want to explain some things to help you find giants. I want you guys to listen close. And if you don't listen close, I'm probably going to hit you with a lure. Everybody heard that one. Now, I'm going to talk about something right here. How many people fish dirty water on a regular basis? All right? You're fishing dirty water, okay? So, what I'm going to pick up Everybody knows what a vibrating jig is, a chatterbait. I'll call it by the company's name, whatever, I have no relation. And then I have a jig. In dirty water, you have some options to find big fish. The glide bait doesn't work very well. You wouldn't know if they fall it up to your toes if you can't see your hand a foot or two under the water. You have no idea. So how do you find big fish in dirty water? Now, you can go grab a french fry like this Seco right here. You can throw this Seco all freaking day in dirty water and you can catch one, two, three. Hey, you may even get lucky and catch a six or seven pounder like these guys did. But guess what? There's a lot of luck involved if you're throwing something that appeals to baby fish, okay? 
This also appeals to big fish if it falls in their lap. If it falls in their lap, they're gonna say, hey, why not? And I'll eat it. But there's things that appeal to big fish. So I want you to do this. Everybody that has not caught a five pounder, people who have, okay, I want you to keep this stuff in mind. Who knows what this is? Exactly, the evolution baked grass fern. This is a buzz bait, right? Now, if I throw this down in there, and it's on the top, and I see a little squirrel, I'm probably guessing it's a little fish, right? Now I know, okay, but there's a fish that lives there, I can probably catch them. If I come back and throw a french fry like a Senko. But if I see a big fish go boom, and miss it, and I have never caught a big fish in that spot, I am now 120% positive a freaking big one lives there. If I come back later, and I throw the buzz bait again, he doesn't bite it, now I will grab this stinking french fry and throw it in there and be like, all right, come and get it, come and get it. And when she eats it, I wasn't guessing that a big fish lived there. I was 100% positive why everyone else was taking a guess. Hang with us guys, we'll be right back. Hey guys, did you know that Jurors Truly is now hosting Lucky Tackle Box's monthly panfish instructionals? And aside from relentless fish catching, I'll be breaking down the rigging and the gear you need to get going along the way. And of course, a few extra tips to help you score more fish on the goodies included in your box. So remember, the tug is our drug. So go visit LuckyTackleBox.com and get signed up today. Bigger, better, batter. The evolution of the buzz bait is upon us. The evolution bait's grass burner is a high performance bass snatching machine. High end components, inline displacement, larger profile, balanced body for fast or slower retrieves, better deflection, and oversized treble hooks. You wouldn't bring a slingshot to a gunfight, would you? Find out more at evolutionbaits.com. Ever try pulling a planer board next to your boat when trolling or fishing from a swift current bank? If not, you're missing out on one of the most phenomenal fish catching machines on the market today. With Yellowbird planer boards pulling your lines perpendicular to your boat, you can't help but catch more fish. Find out more by visiting www.yellowbirdproducts.com. Did you know that P-Line makes specialized lines for all your fishing needs? From the super strong, abrasive resistant CXX or the low stretch, super stealthy CX Premium. Or maybe you're looking for invisibility or super bite detection with P-Line's 100% fluorocarbon. No matter what your needs, P-Line's got it covered. To find out more, visit P-Line.com. P-Line, baby! Attention Northern California anglers, have you been to boat country in Escalon with one of the largest selections of welded aluminum fishing boats from North River, Hughes Craft, and now Crestliner? Chances are they have the right boat for you. And did I mention they have a full service center to take care of all your repair or boating maintenance needs? If you're a boat owner or just looking to become one, you owe it to yourself to check these guys out. Visit BoatCountryUSA.com or stop on by. We'll see you there. You ever heard of Cal Coast Fishing's Rod Mule? For super convenient rod transfer or storage? And how about the Bait Sack, a puncture-proof, clip-on bait protector that comes in an assortment of sizes? Or maybe you're looking for the best non-puncture calling system with Cal Coast Fishing Clip and Call. And it wouldn't be complete without a money beam. I trust it when money's on the line. And let's not forget the Cali Clip, a super convenient, dual-purpose bait clip. Want to find out more? Visit calcoastfishing.com. Now, let's say I'm throwing that buzz bait, and it's, it's too cold. Okay, let's say, when is it too cold to throw a buzz bait? Below, below 60 degrees, you're probably right in there, okay? Imagine, 60 degrees is cut off, some people 55 if you're determined, okay? But below 60 degrees, then I wanna come after a top water. Vibrating jig, a chatterbait. One out of five bites you get on this is usually a big, big fish. What does that mean? If you get 10 bites on this in a day, you have two kickers in your bag of five fish. Now you have a quality limit of bass. They don't want to hit this, you can slow down and throw a traditional half ounce jig. You throw a half ounce jig with a big crawdad trailer on there like that, one out of three fish that eat a traditional half ounce jig with a skirt and full crawdad body out of there is bigger than normal. So if I throw this, I throw this, I throw the buzz bait, I have a good idea whether I caught that fish or not, that I know where a big one is. Even if I miss three times in a row on this, I know chances are one of those three misses was a big one. Now I have a much better idea and I'm not guessing. Is this making sense? It, you guys probably already knew that stuff though, right? <laughs> oh, look at that. That's a grass burner. Oh my gosh, a $25 bait? What in the world? Hey, you got a 
thank the guys at Evolution Base for putting that up. That's awesome. So, let's say I'm throwing a blind bait and there is no rainbow trout where I live. What does this look like? You guys are right, it looks like a whale. You're right. Yep, this happens to be a bluegill swim bait. This happens to be called a gantrell. Do I have any affiliation with him? No. Watch what happens when I reel this and stop. It stays there. What does that have that's similar to my jerk bait? He likes it.
in the deepest of spots. What happens with all of our doors? We have it. It's not equal in our head. If we see something, if this is the edge of a boat dock right here, a lot of guys will try to land it right here. I will throw it as hard as I freaking can and deflect it under that dock. I will throw it over the dock. How many see my episode with Billy Hines where I both put the fish up on top of the dock? Let me tell you a story about that. Just under, just under six pounds. Tough day, getting small ones on the frog. Okay, we're going around, we're going around through the boat dock area. I skip one, oh look at that, 65 pound break. Ooh. Let me tell you a story about 65 pound break. I was skipping, oh look at that, a square wheel. Oh look at that. I was throwing on 65, I was actually throwing on 50 pound break, and I was skipping this rock under the docks. I start aiming Billy Hines on. He's over here, and I'm like, man, you know what's going to happen, baby. You know what's going to Like, I can't help but talk trash the whole time. Just what I do with a fisherman, okay? If you don't talk trash, you're probably not that good. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, so I'm talking trash to Billy, and I go to Billy my frog real quick, and I look down. There she was. Six pounder. Uh, after my frog, and I wasn't looking at my frog, and I reeled away from her, and I'm like, no, and I see her going, Woo, going back into the dock, and she goes under the dock, and I'm like, dang it, I skip up there again, she doesn't follow it out, all right, I said, okay, Billy, we're going four-wheel drive, dude, I only got a 50-pound rate on, though, this is, I'm probably going to break her off, I try to flip her over the dock, I cast over the dock, and I hear her, whoosh, I look at my line, my line jump, wham, and I hit her, and Billy goes, Pull her over the dock, sissy! Pull her over the dock! Don't be the sissy! Be a hero! Be a hero! And I'm like, I only got 50 pounds on. I've done, I broke off doing this. And we've got this dilemma going on. He's like, don't touch the trolling motor. Don't touch And I run up and I get on the trolling motor. And I jump out on the dock like a sissy. And I flip her up. And yeah, I edited all the trash talk out of that part. Boy, Billy would have made me look horrible. But I got her. And the reason why I threw out that 65 pound braid is I have pulled literally two, three hundred, three to five pound bass over boat docks on a 65 pound braid because nobody else wants to cast over them. One of my buddies right here, Travis Averill, right down here, this guy is an incredible frog fishing machine and him and I both know 65 pound braid you can throw it through somebody's front door, out their back window, get stuck around the swing set, and eats it, you just pull, and the swing set will slam against the back door, and it'll start working through the house. You're gonna hook their kids' toys, and you just keep pulling. You just keep pulling. And next thing you know, man, that bass is right at your freaking toes, because you have two big giant hooks stuck to that fish. Four-wheel drive. Tell you guys about some secret patterns. I'm gonna keep hitting that pallet. Oh, he screwed my bait up. Oh, oh, come on, come on. I see him getting hot. So, little cool story. I want to tell you guys about patterns that most people don't know about. How many people know me for kicking butt on Lake Comanche? Right? I've only fished that lake 20 times ever. Okay? I have to get it figured out what I thought. I'm over there in is that August or September. That copper bike is August, right? So I'm throwing, 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 getting my butt kicked. I got zero bites. Zero. I'm like, dude, I mean, I don't want to do it, Dad. My dad over there behind the camera. He's like, knock it off. Just go catch him already. I don't want to do it. It's freaking hot. It's 105. I'm like, screw it, man. We're going to go fish some shade. I don't think they're shallow, but we're going to go fish some shade. So we run back up river, and there's these little cuts, real shady little cuts. We get up there, and I'm throwing jerk baits. I'm throwing Edwards, throwing an Alabama ring, not getting nothing. I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put on a frog, man. I'm going to throw a frog. I have, ne I have never caught a frog fish at Lake Comanche. I'm fishing 25 foot deep all the time at Lake Comanche. So we go over to this back corner, all right? Dirtiest water I ever seen in Lake 
Comanche. Now everybody knows Lake Comanche looks like this. It's beautiful. So, oh, oh, oh. I thought I was going to get that one to go. So, we go back there and it's dirty water. And literally, there's like, it's a canyon, okay? And there's trees on all sides. And it's shaded down there. And I, I got some shade, so I'm feeling a little better. I tell my dad, I'm just going to throw it up into this mud and see if anything lives here. No idea anything was there. This is the worst, dirtiest water I've ever seen. This little creek channel is no bigger than this. Like, literally, big giant lake, little dirty creek. What does it do? It runs into a little dirty creek. Doesn't make sense? No, it doesn't. Don't do that. Unless, I'm back there, I'm throwing the frog, throwing the frog, throwing the frog. Not catching nothing. I see the slimiest creek in the whole lake. And I'm like, all right. And I whip this little whoop back in. This water should not be but this deep. And I see, whoo, wham! And a bass grabs my freaking frog and leaps up on the edge of the bank. Like she's on the dirt and then she's like bouncing back in. I go to set the hook. Yeah, I missed. I missed. <laughs> she, she got in the left. Like she literally, she like ran it herself and I missed. So, it happens. It happens. Now, she flops back in. I'm like, there's no way she's gonna bite again. You can ask that man right there, for real. No way she's gonna bite again. Now I'm focused. I'll make the cast over there. Boom, blows up again. I drill her. Go, 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 go. I got her on top. She's like four. Comes off. But I see all sorts of commotion happen. Like, I see commotion happen, and I'm like, what the heck? I throw it up there, I catch her. Land her this time. I'm like, what is going on? The water's moving. I thought there was carp up there. Water's shaking all over the place. I'm looking around, like, what is this? We notice all sorts of baby bullfrogs. That's when they go from tadpole to actual frog is in the middle of freaking summer. Even on these big rocky lakes, they're right there. Like, right freaking there. They're all jumping in. All these giant bass are like this against the shoreline, like looking up. And they're eating all these frogs. So, I missed a couple of upsets and I'm like, you know what, man? I'm not going to miss anymore. I'm going to grab out the first lure that we all learned to throw a top water bait. And I grabbed a pop off. I went on a spank fest of destroying bass when nobody had any idea they were in the shallow, snotty, muddy water when this beautiful lake was out behind me and I was destroying them. Six, seven, I think I got one just under eight. And I called my buddies like, put your boat back in. They were already doing it. They were already doing it. They went there, they had the same day that I had up to that point. Nothing. And I was like, maybe this is special for Lake Comanche. I called one of my buddies who's out deer hunting around the lungs. And he goes, dude, there's frogs everywhere. Everywhere. And I'm like, hey, give me a favor, go back there tomorrow, throw a pop and throw a frog and see if you catch them. Jacked them. Jacked them. Like, there was little frogs everywhere around these mother low lakes. And this is in the middle of summer. In the, in the sun, wherever these frogs jumped in, there was fish, man. And this pattern went on for about three weeks until we didn't see the frogs anymore. This works. Go find muddy water and muddy shorelines in the middle of the summer that have shade. And there's going to be baby frogs on those, and you can catch them on a frog. So you guys know what company I work for? What's a national level company that I'm the spokesperson for? You're right. Now, there's more of those to come. Oh yeah. Who knows my buddy Travis Moran? Now, me and Travis were out on Clear Lake, okay? And we're doing pretty good. Travis is a stud. I'm all right. Now what happens is, so we're going, we're going, we're going, we're going, we're going. Okay? And I told Travis, man, let's go to the Rodman Slough and I'm going to skip these trees, dude. I'm going to perfect your skipping game, man. I wanted to boast to Travis, so we go in there. And I, I skip up to the shoreline. I hit the shoreline and I see some little red crash station. I'm like, oh, Water and I see the water shake. I'm like, wow! And at the same time, my jig rod goes, Ding! and I'm on. Okay, and I catch about a three and a half. It wasn't spectacular. Great fish. Wasn't spectacular. And we noticed something. I said, do me a favor. Pull up to that shoreline. I want to take a look and see what's up there. All these little holes in the bank. You guys know what those are? Crawdad burrows. Okay. Everybody thinks. 
going in the mud, and they, oh, oh yeah, oh, I got the biggest one in the tank, it's a crappie. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll be here now. Hold on. Hold on, we're doing, we're doing a selfie with you guys in here. I can't believe I just caught the crappie. That's instant. Yeah! Now that's awesome. Anybody else catch a crappie? Yeah, I didn't want it. Jason, you catch a crappie? Now if you guys know, I'm notorious for my shaky hand trimmers. Whoa, look at that crappie get all surprised like that. Wanted some. So anyhow, we hit the bank up there, and I see all these muddy holes. And I'm looking at a wall, stuff full of crawdads. So we start running around the lake, looking for those muddy shorelines with holes in them. Guess what? Every lake has them. You'll go, you'll go down any lake, there'll be sheer slate rock wall, and all of a sudden you'll get to this spot that has holes. You don't see the crawdads in there? They're in the water. They're in the freaking water. If you don't throw a jig in that spot, you're out of your mind, because that area is where the crawdads live. That is a key indication of where the crawdads are. So remember that. That is a special little trick for catching big bass on a jig. You can throw a frog up there too, they're gonna eat it. They're all gonna be around the shoreline whenever you see those holes, and especially if you see crawdads up by those holes. All right, so that's two secret patterns. That happens in the middle of the summer with the crawdads, and the frog thing happens in the middle of the summer. So keep this stuff in mind. Now everybody wanted to know a secret trick that I was doing on the California Delta. Last, was it last November? It was, this November we did good, but it was last November that we had like a 36 pound bag, right? So in November, two years ago, I started dialing a trick about five or six years ago. And the trick was using the strike, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Sorry, lost my mind. Oh man. Eat it. So, whoo, man. Let's do that again, let's do that again. All right, Wayne, that pallet really needs to move. Let's get a crew in here, let's get that pallet on. So, out on the California Delta, how many people have seen striker boils? Pop, 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 on the surface, see birds diving all over. You know what loves to eat stripers? Big bass. Big bass love to eat striker bass. Love it. A lot of people wonder, like, do they even like it? Oh, no, no, they love striped bass. You can go up to those schools, you throw something like this, you're gonna catch striper, 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 striper. And you can do that all day long. You can catch 100 fish and have a blast, I love doing that. I waste his time all the time, and he's like, dude, come on, man, let's finish this video. I'm like, sorry, Dad, I'm a fisherman, I gotta get bit, I gotta get bit, I gotta get bit. So, when you pull up and you see those little striper boils going on, if you have something about the size of one of those small stripers, listen to this, quote me, quote me, this is a statement that you have never heard from a competitive bass fisherman, freaking quote me. If you see those stripers busting 10, 12 feet from the shoreline or against the shoreline with riprap rocks, riprap rocks, and the delta, 50% of the time you throw a glide in, you will catch a bass over five pounds. 50%. That means all you have to do is find two, and I guaranteed you a five plus pounder. I've caught two double digits, lost a team in a day, had numerous fish over eight or nine pounds, come to the boat for it. That is the secret of Delta Strikers for finding large mouth. Now, oh, oh come on, you just gonna smell it? That's it? That's all she wanted to do? Now, keep that in mind, and I want you guys to do that, okay? You can also go up there when that's going on, 
and there's another bait you can throw. And I taught my buddy Travis this this year. And I'm gonna just exploit our technique brother, so sorry. This is a chatterbait that looks like a shad. It's got a little kite tech on the back, a little swim bait. Doesn't have to be a kite tech, use striking ones, whatever you want. No affiliation there. Once those stripers stop busting, they move, they chase it, they chase the shad out of it. But guess what? There's tons of wounded shad left over. You throw this in there, the little stripers hit vibrating jigs, but for some reason they don't get them very well. If you get a striker, it'll be a keeper, usually, on a vibrating jig. Do not set the hook. When you feel bam, don't set the hook. Real fast. If you don't feel the fish, back off. Bam! Then all of a sudden, the leftover big largies, and you can watch my video. Anytime you see white birds in the background of my videos, this is what I've been doing for the last couple of years. This secret right here is probably worth 20,000 bucks at any competitive bass fishing. I guarantee you. I will throw this in there, and you guys probably seen the video where I went to boat flip a 10 pounder, she flies off, and I'm like, oh, yeah. I thought I died for a minute. Yeah, well, two casts later, I stuck an eight and a half doing this. And this is, I was throwing the glide, got a couple of good ones, okay? Throwing the glide, strikers moved off, I immediately picked up my chatterbait, yeah, it's my buddy right here. Start smoking them, smoking them, like ridiculously good largemouth fishing. Now, you're also gonna hear competitive bass fishermen that are gonna say, if those stripers around, we're going somewhere else. We don't want to deal with all those thorny little things. And you've probably seen that thorny little striper in here that wants to poke it. Come on. Now, they leave these things alone. Come on, come on, come on, come on. They leave the stripers alone. A lot of bass fishermen, because they don't like dealing with it. And then other striper fishermen are like, oh, those are just the baby ones. Guess what is also there with those giant large mouths? Giant stripers. How many people have fished Tracy? How many people have fished Stockton Delta, the North Delta? And you can't seem to catch a striper over this big. It's just like every single striper, the whole entire system is 17 and a half inches. And it's like, Whoa, dude, I caught, I caught 50 fish today at, uh, an inch short of being a keeper. Guess what's eating those? The giant, giant striper. This year, I'm throwing this jerk bait, okay? I'm throwing it out there, I'm catching little stripers. I'm reeling in this little 14 incher. I just yanked the hook out of my dad's arm. My bad. The poor guy, man, he gets it good sometimes. And uh, I, I just take a hook out of his arm, and I, I hook into this little 14 inch striper. Nothing new, I caught 100 of them that day. I reach down for the needle nose, and I'm like looking for the striper. I feel my rod. On my hand, I look down. There's a striper, 30 plus pounds, that swallowed my 14 inch striper. Like, gone. So I started to bow up on her, thinking my jerk bait will get her. Now, now, she regurgitates the fish right in front of me. I go, oh man, that sucked. She turns around and eats it again. I open my spool and I'm feeding the line. I'm like, man, I'm going to let her get this thing good. I want this fish. Boom, regurgitates it again. I'm like, dang it. I immediately reach down and I grab this big swim bait right here. I throw it, I look into a striper about 19 pounds. Almost got her to the boat, comes off. Oh well, I don't care, I hooked it, I thought it was a lot of fun. Very next cast, I hook a nine pounder and lay on that. Then the stripers were gone. But I was doing my largemouth trick, okay? And that thing came up and ate a 14 inch striper. I'll throw swim baits that are yeah, six, seven inches in Tracy, in the Stockton Delta, and I will hardly ever see a striper that big. This year, I went to those little striper boils, just like doing my largemouth trick, and I threw giant fly baits. I hooked a couple of absolute monsters that I had no idea were there. The reason why we don't catch the big ones out of the schools of little ones is because we want to get bit. We'll pick up something that the small ones are gonna chew on. And that's what happens. That is, that is the reason we are not catching the big ones when those small ones are around. 100% positive, the big ones are there eating them. Guaranteed. So, let's see.
Thank you. 